Uh, let's talk about democracy. In principle, democracy is supposed to mean one person, one vote. In other words, it's supposed to prioritize the sanctity of the individual. Of course, that's not how it's ever played out in human history. Uh, women, of, of course, did not always have the vote. Uh, minorities did not always have the vote, and so on and so forth. So let's talk about why that's happened and how we can move forward into perhaps a more progressive state. So with, with democracy, we're finding that it's useless without two important elements. One is an independent media, and the other is an independent judiciary. Without those two things, democracy simply becomes a way for power to multiply itself at the expense of morality and all other considerations. And that just goes back to the, to the principle that, you know, power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. And as we're thinking about democracies and when, why they've taken on such a, you know, sort of malicious turn in many developed countries, we want to consider the fact that it's not necessarily the democratic system that's at fault. It's once again, the age old principle that without independent checks and balances, all power tends to corrupt. And that can happen in a dictatorship, it can happen in a democratic system, and that's really been the biggest lesson of all, is that these systems themselves don't really mean anything. Their names or labels mean almost nothing. What really matters is the capacity of that system to provide independent checks and balances in order to, in order to prevent overextension in all areas in all areas of government, whether on the military side or in the civilian side. Uh, that includes education, everything you can think of. Now, what's interesting is that in the U.S., we've had gerrymandering. We've had, you know, quite a few issues that have created a problem even with, an, you know, an independent judiciary or an independent media. The state of California is, is, is an interesting example because it's, it's basically a one-party state. The Democratic Party controls almost the entire state. Uh, one of the reasons is that People don't really understand American history. They don't understand that, you know, first of all, the reason this country is, is primarily uh, German immigrants is because it's a country of German refugees. The Germans had so many different issues uh, in 1848, 1849, 1850. That was probably the first wave. And then, of course, you've got, you know, World War One and World War Two. And at the time, the New World was the United States. And part of that was you know, you, you had a, a system where you had a lot of land, you needed people to develop the land, and so on and so forth. And so at that time, the United States was, may have been in a, in a position where it could have, you know, you know, attracted, uh, you know, quite a few workers, because it needed workers to not only, not only work the land, but to do many other tasks, you know, this was the time before machines. And that's just one country, right? You've got, of course, the Irish, you've got all these sorts of issues, um, you know, across Europe that have led to the United States, at least until recently, being essentially a country of European refugees. With respect to California, uh, you'll notice that the, you know, the South, uh, you know, has, has basically been colonized by, by Catholic Spain. And, you know, using the proceeds of the slave trade, which was a tremendous industry, uh, you know, back in the day, you had development all the way through California, uh, you know, essentially using the proceeds as a way to expand influence. Not so much the north, so the farther north you go, you've got the Protestants and the people who came here, uh, who because they were they were suffering discrimination from the Catholics, and so they went up, up north. At some point, they had the French Revolution. The French Revolution kicked out the Catholics. They had to keep moving farther, farther, and farther west. Eventually, they just came over to uh, the United States. Uh, and so the North, you can think of as being colonized, in a sense, by, you know, the Protestants from Europe, also refugees for the most part, uh, and also the South uh, being completely different. This, of course, creates the groundwork for the Civil War. And, you know, of course, that has a lot to do with the Catholic Church's acceptance of slavery uh, within its worldwide empire. And in the United States, of course, you know, the North couldn't really, didn't really have as much of an interest in manual labor because it couldn't grow tobacco and cotton as well as uh, the the South, which had a different climate. And so you, you this sort of 
you know, issue, you know, created a, a lot of issues, uh, you know, overall. This idea of the acceptance of chattel slavery, the idea of certain climates being more conducive to certain industries, uh, you know, and, and especially when you think about the fact that there isn't a technology industry back in the day. You know, if it's cotton, it's tobacco, probably alcohol, you know, very simple things like agriculture and so on and so forth. And so you weren't in a position where you could build a company in your garage and then go to the stock market and then get an IPO and then create an industry, uh, especially not one that was entirely new. And so when you look at, say, California, you have most of the cities, you know, in from the middle all the way down are have Spanish names. And you can see, in fact, right here in Santa Clara, California, there's, with the, there's a mission that was founded. And if you look at the date, the mission was founded in Santa Clara. Uh, it, it coincides with the date uh, of the French Revolution, which is when essentially that money stopped coming over uh, from Europe. And so the Catholics, you know, the Catholic Spanish influence essentially stopped around, right in the middle of California. It never quite made, it, made its way up north. And so you see, you know, you know, just look at, look at the names, you know, all these names have meanings. Nova Scotia, I believe Nova means new. So Scotia, I believe means, you know, you can go look this up. It's Scotland, maybe. Um, but, you know, these are all, you know, you've got all these immigrants leaving Europe and coming here. And, they, you know, remember, this was called the New World. Well, it's literally in the names of some of these cities, um, you know, like Nova so-and-so. Uh, in Tennessee, there's a, a town of refugees called Germantown. Uh, very obvious, you know, where Germ you know, they were still keeping on retaining their identity, you know, even when they came here. And they probably spoke German up until World War I. So they probably, if you look at, you know, try to tie history together, they probably were refugees from the 1848, 1849, and thereafter, um, you know, and, and issue in, in terms of the, not necessarily pogroms, right, but civil conflict. And so you can sort of look at the names in some cases and try to figure, work your way backwards and try to figure out how history really happens. Um, for example, let's take a quick diversion. Uh, Quebec still speaks French, so you, you can actually realize, you know, that they were able to maintain some independence because they actually beat the American advance into the north. And so today, uh, you have Canada and then you have this Quebec-speaking portion because the Quebecois uh, essentially stopped the Americans from moving farther up north and conquering the north, uh, farther north. And so they were able to retain that identity. And the West, Calgary, essentially today looks like Texas. Why? It's got oil. And so they have rodeos. They have, you know, it's indistinguishable from a Texas uh, climate. Sorry, <laughs> not a climate, a Texas culture. Um, if you just go there, you know, you really do feel like you're, you know, in, the, in, the, in similar places. And in fact, that's the case because you have money from Texas coming into the north. Oil is famously a cyclical business. And so, you know, the Americans have been able to buy up a lot of the leases in Calgary. And so they're, you know, almost, I'm not going to say they're an American colony, uh, but, you know, when you look at the amount of leases that the American companies and the Americans own in Canada, you can see why that culture would be, would overlap. You can see why the Calgary culture would overlap with uh, the Texan culture. Whereas in the East, it's completely different. Now, we can get back to the central point here about democracies and how they evolved into what we see today. Um, and what we have to understand is that, you know, with, you know, within a system that lacks independent checks and balances, all democracy really becomes is an opportunity to grow your own base, regardless of the truth. In other words, to grow your own voting base, regardless of whether what you're doing is right or wrong. And we've seen this before, right? You've seen this where, you know, you have the quote unquote communist purges under McCarthy, um, you know, you have these loyalty pledges, you have all sorts of things. And all these little, well, I shouldn't say little, all these, all these issues that come up with abortion, with these moral flashpoints, uh, death penalty, drugs, a lot of them, again, are just ways to differentiate who's on your side, who's in your country club versus who's on the outside. And it, it's, it's an easy way to, to say, all right, I want, I want to promote these people because they're going to vote for me on this contentious issue. And I'm going to tie it to morality because that's an easy way to get people's attention. You can do that on some level. But what's interesting is that, you know, of course, this is a country that evolved from chattel slavery and yet did not deem that to be a moral issue at the time and now has become on the surface um, in a very superficial way. It is, it is trying to divide the country 
on so-called morality uh, clauses, such as abortion. And, and it used to be the death penalty was a much bigger issue until people did a cost-benefit analysis and then realized that the death penalty is, is essentially a jobs program for lawyers, uh, especially in states like California where no one gets executed because the common law, the judge-made law, has been so um, protective of uh, custody, of, of you know, just the rights of, of people within custody to uh, receive a fair trial. And, and, and we know with DNA evidence, you know, exonerating so many people that in fact the California courts uh, have been justified in creating that level of scrutiny, uh, which in turn has basically created um, a way for lawyers to, you know, ex extend their influence on a hot button issue that is no longer quite so hot button uh, because more and more people realize the deficiencies in the system. And so we've moved away from that. Um, you know, we haven't quite moved away from abortion. And that is, of course, a, a product of the Catholic influence in this country and so on and so forth. Now, with this idea of power seeking to expand itself at the expense of others, you know, we've just understood why we have so many different morality, sort of unofficial morality clauses. Uh, and this this modifies, this changes all the time. You know, right now we're in COVID. Whether or not somebody wears a mask can be a signifier of a certain morality test. Uh, and so you see that governments have an interest in making sure uh, that you constantly are dividing yourselves based on issues that allow the establishment to maintain power. Um, as opposed to something that's more concrete, like the economy, a sustainable economic system, sustainable funding across the nation, and so on and so forth. Now, once you have that background and you understand how important independence is within any system, you can also try to compare systems. Um, now, within the system we have here, we have a, a situation where clearly we don't really have independent checks and balances. And that's a problem because in the United States, the system is set up so that local governments have tremendous, have tremendous, um, can create tremendous obstacles to reform at the national level. We've seen that now with, with four years of Donald Trump attempting to create major changes across the nation. That's failed. Uh, we still have a pension crisis. We have public pension crisis. We still have a lot of issues. Entitlement reform has not happened. Uh, almost, in fact, the issues are the same as they were before. And it's hard to say that any sort of real reform has happened despite electing somebody uh, that is uh, completely different from anyone the country has ever elected before. And so you see that that's by, you know, that that's a product of the system itself. And, you know, that is also one reason why so few people vote. Now, one of the reasons you have vo low voter turnout is because, you know, in many states uh, bar people from who have felony records from voting. Now, it turns out that this country is so uh, mired in a police state, a mentality that about 8% of the population uh, has a felony record. 8%. I'm not, you know, you can look this up. So a lot of the low voter turnout, you have, you know, uh, uh, those numbers are, you know, legitimately low, but, you know, you can see right away that if you prevent 8% of the country from voting, the, the voter turnout will be, you know, sitting already, you know, from inception, uh, prejudiced in a sense, uh, towards against full participation. So we can look at that. And then we can, you know, again, just think about the principles we just talked about in the sense that, you know, if you don't have independent checks and balances, all you're really doing is trying to use the media and other sources within your control to expand your power. And to do that, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make the other side look bad. And if you only have a two-party state, it becomes even more problematic um, simplic in, a, in a simplistic way. You only have one side you have to make look bad in order to win. And of course, sometimes that backfires. You know, with Donald Trump, and the, one of the reasons he won is because the media establishment um, was going after him in a way that was malicious, uh, mocking him to his face uh, at different correspondent dinners. And this is not, you know, this is just a businessman. It's not necessarily somebody who's, he's not necessarily somebody who's, you know, you know there's a sort of, he never tried to argue that he was a philosopher king of some sort. He just said, I'm a businessman. And, you know, that's, yeah, I am what I am, essentially. And so for the Hollywood establishment to sort of go after him in the way that it did, 
justifiably created backlash and led to one of the one of the reasons you know and he won now when you look at you know the the sort of scenario where you are trying to grow only your own base suddenly the media right you know you can also create a system where the media becomes biased cnn dot right now dot com at least uh is without question a bias in favor of a biden uh, election every single i mean it's, it's remarkable how one-sided they are and this is a mainstream publication so you can see that you know when you take over a national election in many cases right these media companies become an arm of one party rather than the other in ways that are only seeking to expand their own base at any cost and at any expense. When I say any cost, you want to think, think about how expensive media is in this country. Um, right now, Joe Biden's campaign has a billion dollars uh, to spend from uh, New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who has donated that money uh, initially to run his own campaign, and then when he dropped out, that money essentially can be used, uh, apparently, uh, for other purposes within that election. So you, at this point, have a, a country where elections are, are being bought. Uh, in the last election, I'm sure you know Donald Trump probably had either equivalent money or not. This, this election is actually outgunned financially. I believe his campaign, last time I checked, had about half a, half a billion dollars and, you know, with Bloomberg's, well, Biden's campaign also had about half a billion dollars, but with Bloomberg's contributions, uh, it's now a 1.5 billion versus half a billion dollars. You have essentially billionaires buying elections through the media. Why is that happening? Again, it's happening, and I don't, want, I don't mean to be repetitive, I want you to make sure you get this point. It's happening because in a two-party system, where parties do not have independent checks and balances on any sort of realistic scale or practical scale, all that's happened is the media becomes an arm of one of the two parties. And the consequences should be quite obvious. Now, in this system where local governments are designed to essentially resist national reforms, you can see why the system, quite frankly, seems to be a failure. Because no matter how much money you spend, the establishment and you know stays the same. And part of the reason we have to understand why this is the case, because... Part of the reason is, is let's talk about the Soviet Union, let's talk about the Russian Empire. One of the reasons there were so many coups in other countries is because they had a, central, a purely centralized government. And they were looking at other, at other you know, systems in Europe, and they realized that we don't want to have a local system because you know, local systems can be as corrupt uh, as anything else and so have to be, eventually have to be reined in. So why don't we just cut that corruption part out and just start in the middle and then create a system that you know, lacks this sort of corruption due to other uh, cities and municipalities moving farther and farther away from the central government's planning and eventually becoming a problem uh, in terms of unification. And so the, under, under the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union's you know, sort of system, you can see that, you know, first of all, they had a lot of coups because you only had to have a few thousand people to take over the capital city in order to control the entire country. And that's not something that can happen in the U.S. In the U.S., they, they would say, well, sure, we have corrupt local governments, but under the Constitution, one of the it was set up that way so that even if you managed to conquer, say, Washington, D.C., uh, it wouldn't really do you any good. You would still have to go in in order to take over the country and conquer all 13 colonies or all 50 states, which... If you look at the Second Amendment, all of which were designed to have local militias, uh, you know, people, white men primarily that owned guns and were able to defend each city as well as any sort of military uh, under back in the day without, you know, without a Navy, without, you know, without a major, sorry, sorry, without a major sort of, you know, aircraft carrier of some sort um, and so on and so forth. So we can see that there is different systems. And then once again, the, the real issue is how well that centralized government, we'll call it communist, or you know, how well that, that system can create wealth all across its entire geography. Uh, and you can see that it's possible to do so. It's, you know, communist China today is an example of that. They're, uh, they're creating a middle class all over the country. And they're doing it in a very steady way. Uh, of course, they have similar problems in, in say, big cities uh, in terms of inflation, especially in housing. Uh, so they're not immune from the same problems as capitalists, 
or under, or I really should say with labels, right? I really should say under a more diversified system that allows local entities uh, to differ uh, from in their policies from the national government. So really, when we talk about capitalism versus socialism, what we're really talking about are two different systems. One is centralized and one is decentralized. And once we get these labels out of the way, we can see that we can probably try to progress a little bit you know, easier in having these discussions. And so the United States, of course, because you know, of that militia, um, you know, of that militia component, eventually evolved into a country where local police had tremendous power because they were the ones that were protecting that city. Uh, or that, you know, that county. And you can see how that would also create problems in a country that has been enforcing racial segregation and that has denied the vote to minorities uh, throughout much of its history. And you can see how that is tied into the militia and police system. <sighs> and so you can see that these are not problems that are, that are necessarily... Um, you know, so that are necessarily the, the, the fault of either a capitalist, socialist, or decentralized, or, you know, centralized systems, there's an amalgam of problems that have to be fixed in order for these systems to have any hope of reform, what, what, whatever label you give it. Now, uh, let's quickly talk about the third way. Now, within the United States, you have the Amish and Mennonite communities, and you can buy products from them online. Online, they still use, you know, uh, they sell online, and they're, you know, they're known for silver in some places in Pennsylvania, but they're also known for jam. Essentially, they're known for homemade products. Now, you can see that, you know, they're also known for agriculture. If you go into Iowa, you know, the kids sometimes use horses, uh, Shetland ponies, I think, just to get to school. Uh, they don't have cars, and some, you know, and, uh, well, the Mennonites have cars, I believe, but not the Amish. It's, it's different, right? But all of them essentially opted out of the government and the globalized economy, in a sense, so the modern economy, uh, based on their opposition to war. And you can see that they are, are perhaps the most principled people in America. And in order to maintain those principles, they've had to opt out of modern conveniences. Uh, and they've essentially created an economy that would be right at home in the 1800s or the, 19, or the early 1900s. And so right away, we see that we have three different systems. You have a system where I'm sure the Amish and Mennonites were, had to flee, especially because you were, they had a, you know, the United States had a draft, right? You, you had to fight um, because you were drafted if you were a healthy male. And if you're anti-war and you want to opt out of these systems, whether you're a Jehovah's Witness or a Muslim in the case of Muhammad Ali, uh, you can see that very, you know, very quickly that in order to have these systems in place, you're not going to get the, the support of the local governments or the national governments, and so you're on your own. And that means also that your banking systems, which are tied into federal policies, such, such as the Federal Reserve's willingness to lend, to extend credit, you're essentially on your own because you're not able to tie your, your economy into the banking system, and therefore you're not able to grow in the same way as others within that country. And so you want to think about the system where, out of these three systems, centralized, decentralized, and then principled, the least modernized, system is the one that has the most principles. And that should give you some pause when you're trying to argue about superior systems. Now, you can see that one of the reasons is, is that, you know, we have these sorts of issues is, is number one, the banking sector in the United States is probably the, probably the strongest sector uh, worldwide and it has perhaps the strongest uh, wide moat, uh, strongest um, desirability uh, whether it's in adaptation, whether it's in efficiency, and so on and so forth worldwide. Now, you can see that this also allows local governments to want to sort of move over into this taxation situation and how ta the tax system in modern-day developed economies reduces the stature of the individual. And very quickly, you know, you can imagine, first of all, most, you know, most taxes are from an, ind an individual basis uh, are, you know, come from the very affluent. I believe, believe it's, it's, there's a statistic, a statistic somewhere where I'm sure you can look this up where I imagine just based on the levels of wealth inequality in the country, uh, I can imagine, you know, that probably 20% of the, you know, the top 20% probably pay 60 to 70%. I'm just making this up, but I'm, I'm just guessing uh, of, all the of all the individual taxes. 
uh, income taxes, income taxes. We don't, we're not looking at all these other fees and taxes. A lot of local governments rely on fees. You, know, you pay a fee to drive a car every day, no, sorry, every year. You pay all, you know, all these sorts of things. And those aren't considered taxes for some reason, even though they really are. <clears throat> and so you can see that, you know, one way that local communities are able to expand their own base at the expense of the truth and at the expense of morality and so on and so forth, because they don't need taxes from you, the individual, anymore. They can just go to the bank and get a loan as long as they can show, you know, economic growth. Now, economic growth within the U.S. can be in the form of, form of an IPO. And so you can see that under this idea that the top 10 percent of every country is responsible for its progress, especially technologically, you can see that within this this sort of paradigm this that W.E.B. Du, Bo uh, du Bois came up with, uh, and he wasn't sure, it's not the first one, right, uh, to come up with that idea that the top 10% of, the, of, of any country are the ones that propel the country forward. You can see that under that paradigm, especially within a banking system that is able to multiply money uh, through an IPO system and attract investment, you can see very quickly that individuals, you know, don't, don't, you know, not all people are the same, that one vote, one individual uh, system, uh, one person, one vote system doesn't really matter anymore when people are, are in debt and when countries are in debt. Um, <clears throat> and so you have this, you know, system where certain people are more important than others. From a taxation system uh, standpoint, you can see that having one Eduardo Saverin or one Zuckerberg is worth a lot, you know, a lot of money in taxes. Uh, and, and not just, again, not just income taxes, but uh, you know, property taxes, you know, a lot of these billionaires buy islands, for God's sakes. I don't know what the property taxes on those are. Uh, and because they're not religious, right, they don't have that tax exemption. So on some level, they pay taxes, even if they put their money into a trust. Uh, on, some level, on some level, they're essentially creating economic growth. And that's just one person and his or her team. Of course, you know, right away you see that you know, you have a system where despite the fact that you're paying taxes and it's burdensome to pay taxes, you know, doing your taxes is not easy. And, you know, so when you do pay that tax, no matter how much it is, the compliance costs in terms of just mental fatigue, uh, filing systems that you have to keep, you know, the time, it's taxing, right? It's taxing on you as the individual, as a citizen, but you're not actually worth that much from a taxation standpoint anymore because you're now in a world where the economy is, worldwide are driven by bank loans and Federal Reserve policies that reduce your stature as an, as, an, as an individual, even though you are profitable, right, in the sense that you're paying income taxes and sales taxes and so on and so forth. But from the perspective of, an, you know, a democracy, you can also see how that, that's a, another way to, another way democracy can be subverted in the sense that, you know, you're no longer you don't need the individual to pay his or her taxes anymore. It's actually, you know, it's sort of like keeping a checking account with $10 at your local bank. It's, it's probably costing them money, right? And in, in this sense, you know, you really have some problems because you really are taxing mentally as well as in other ways, of course, financially, the capacity of the, of the individual uh, to keep up with all these regulations that are really being made to call and keep up with the billionaires and the corporations and the multinational corporations and all these tax shelters that don't necessarily apply to you. And so you can see that one of the limitations used to be that the local governments had to, within the U.S. of, of you know, preventing local governments from going too far astray from national policies was this idea that they had to have a local budget. I'm sorry, a, a balanced budget. They couldn't just borrow infinitely. Um, and yet that's sort of changed now where you really can borrow uh, almost any amount, especially with low interest rates. And so when you're in, a, in this sort of paradigm, when anybody can borrow almost any amount of money, including well, you know, corporations, including governments, the individual doesn't really, really matter if you're outside of that base. If you're not going to help grow that political base, which will then convince the banking system to loan you more money in order to maintain your power and to multiply your power, you're in some sense meaningless or, not, or worthless. Despite the fact that you may, you know, be worth, you know, more in other ways, but within the democratic system that cares only about its own power so that it can maintain its own infrastructure politically and economically, an individual that is against the policies of that sort of twin, you know, intertwining of the banking system and the local government system becomes a threat. And you can see how, whether it's a communist system or a capitalist system, you can see how 
you know, censorship becomes, you know, something that uh, follows in order to maintain the desirability of a local government to uh, to be viewed as a good place to invest and therefore to maintain this, you know, what, what it really is a dependence on banking, on banks and loans and the Federal Reserve uh, keeping low interest rates. And, you know, part of that is that, you know, especially in California, the budget really fluctuates based on capital gains taxes. In other words, the how well the stock market is doing. And so when you figure that out, you suddenly see that, well, you know, what happened to the, to the individual? What, what happened? You know, and you can see right away that democracies, which were supposed to be about one person, one vote, and therefore the sanctity of the individual, all that has been sort of wiped away uh, because of the structure of, you know, not only not only this idea of having a decentralized system, but once you see how the banking system can maintain different structures within a historical perspective of segregation, you can see right away that labels don't, don't necessarily matter when you're trying to think about reform. And once again, you can see why independent, um, you know, judiciaries and independent media sources are so important. Uh, in, in, in sort of creating an environment where at least reform is possible. Now, having discussed that, let's talk about, uh, you know, a scenario where, where obviously the country is, is because of the system of this two-party system is being divided <clears throat> along not just ideological lines and moral, pu moral pu purity tests. Uh, it's, been divided on, and it's been divided in many ways, but one of the problems with having the system in place is that you know, most people don't realize that there really aren't any good answers and, you know, in, turn, in two complex questions, that there are only answers that give you some benefits and some downsides and that, that have more risk and less risk. And let's take a very, let's take a fairly simple example. Let's say jaywalking. Um, let's take somebody, a cop in Baltimore, and the cop in Baltimore is sitting in a car like I am right now and sees a young black man. We don't know how old he is. Uh, he's got a backpack. Um, <clears throat> he's probably got an expensive watch uh, for his age. He looks through, you can argue he may look 17, although somebody else might think differently. Uh, he could be 13, 14, or he can even be 21, depending on how, <clears throat> you know, depending on, on different growth rates. And so one of the first cop, we'll take the example of two police officers. The first cop looks at him and says, you know, this person fits the profile of known drug dealers. He's got a backpack that looks pretty heavy. Uh, you know, he's got an expensive watch. I don't know where, you know, why would a kid have an expensive watch? Uh, this doesn't make any sense. I know that when I go down to the local uh, jail system that people there uh, reflect, uh, resemble this person. So I'm going to pull this guy over for jaywalking and, and, and do a stop and frisk and use the jaywalking as a pretext to see whether or not this guy's a drug dealer. And you can see that, you know, if in fact, you know, the profile of most of the drug dealers in that neighborhood uh, matches the description of a young African-American male, you can see that there's at least some sort of rational basis, uh, you know, with the watch being expensive uh, for at least trying to stop and frisk this person from, a, from that cop's perspective. And we can also see that, that if the cop doesn't do that and it turns out that the, the individual is transporting drugs, uh, you know, from one safe house to another, um, you know, you can also see that you know, by not doing his job, the police officer is in a situation where uh, he or she may be contributing to crime, being, you know, perpetuating itself in that neighborhood. Now, you can take a second police officer who says, well, you know, it's actually, you know, it's 2.45 p.m. I happen to know that's when the schools get out in this neighborhood. He's got a backpack that looks perfectly normal. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, the gold watch, that just might be something his father gave him. Uh, looks like he's got a good build, might be an athlete, um, you know, it might just be, just. A, looks like he's just a normal kid uh, going home or going to some, some friend's house right after school. And I'm not going to arrest this man or try to check do a stop and frisk, even though I'm probably entitled to do so, because it would harm the police, off, the police department's reputation in this community. I really don't have probable cause to take out, to, to stop and frisk. Well, I don't have probable cause to arrest this person based on what I see. Now, if he happens to go into a corner and loiter, if he happened with, a, with a six or seven other people, uh, then I might change my mind, right? If he happens to be, if he's walking, uh, he's not running from me, I think he, think he probably can see me uh, in my police car, which is clearly marked, um, not changing his you know, direction, 
you know, just by himself. So there's no need for me to really to uh, create community tension by arresting this person or trying to do a stop and frisk. And you can see that this pl second police officer is correct also. The cost, if he's wrong, is a total loss of goodwill, not just among that individual, but among all of his friends, especially in an age when social media where teenagers are connected to each other online. And so no matter, you know, you can see right away that the community is really important. Now, in a community where people trust each other you can, and, and the police have a pristine reputation, you can see how in that circumstance, you know, well, you probably wouldn't be in a drug-infested neighborhood, right? Right off the bat, right? That's, that's the first thing. But you can see in a community that has more trust, you can see that, you know, the, the stop won't be something where there's a potential for violence on either side. You can see that in a countries in countries that don't have that weren't founded in ways to in ways that set set up the country uh, to defend itself based on local militias, which may have evolved into local you know police departments and other sort of you know perhaps vigilante vigilante systems, um, you know in part perhaps the KKK in some areas uh, and so on and so forth. And you can see how that stop and frisk could happen easily in a country like Singapore where, you know, we don't have a right to necessarily to an, an, an individual firearm. So the police officer, when he approaches you, feels more secure. And you can, and you happen, if you know anything about Singapore's history, you happen to be in a position where uh, you probably think you might, the worst that's going to happen to you is that you get fined. And you're not going to get killed, you're not going to get beat up, and so on and so forth. And so you, you as a citizen, are when you're approached by somebody in a police officer's uniform in a department that has a pristine reputation in a country with a pristine reputation, that interaction, right, all those moral issues and sorts of risk and reward and goodwill, you don't, even, you don't even have to go there, right, because you've got integrity, and that trumps everything else. Even though in a country like Singapore, you don't necessarily have a lot of, a lot of independent checks and balances. So you can see that all sorts of different systems work in different ways, as long as they promote integrity and investability. Singapore, of course, is famous for having a trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund because of foreign investment, in part due to foreign investment. It's a tiny country. <clears throat> so, you can see right off the bat that when we talk about policing, right, what we're really talking about is how much discretion do we want to give these individual people, these individual government employees. And you can see that in this American system, you can see that you're going to have not only 50 different militias, but 50 within those states, probably a thousand or more different ways of, of handling that simple jaywalking infraction. So when you talk about the United States, and you talk about, you can't really talk about the United States as if, as if it were a centralized country like the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. Uh, you have to talk about it as if it is a, you know, a, an amalgamation of a thousand different, you know, systems. And it really is. So some people look at that and say, well, the real problem here is a lot, you know, too much discretion. You know, we just take this out of the hands of the police officer. We go into a machine-based system uh, that treats people exactly the same. Uh, we have predictive policing where we can say, <clears throat> we just collect data. And, you know, we say that, all right, you know, we've had <clears throat> arrests that, you know, that did lead to evidence of drug use or drug sales in this block. For the last five years, so this is going to be, you know, you've got a you know, higher chance of somebody who's, who's walking down the street and on this block, uh, you know, is in fact a drug dealer versus on that block over there uh, based on historical data and surveillance and so on. And so based on that, we're going to say, you're going to put that into your system and you're going to see or say, uh, you know, we're, we're going to determine your discretion based on the data. Now, of course, that's got problems too, right? You're really using historical data. Uh, what about the data that you don't know about, that you don't see? You know, if, if the data were completely accurate, you wouldn't have crime. Right? You would simply be able to stay with 100% accuracy uh, that this person is a drug dealer uh, or not. And so the fact that you have these sort of percentages, quite frankly, can be mean meaningless. And so you go back to the idea of, are you really dealing with, with competence and integrity, which can trump all these issues that we just talked about by, you know, creating, you know, a... a High reward, low risk interaction. And so we come to the end of the day here, uh, the end of the lesson, so to speak. And you can see that, you know, right off the bat, that if anybody is trying to divide you on the basis of, of some sort of reform, which quite frankly is going to be impossible to do on a national level in the US, it's specifically set up to resist national reform, as we've just seen in the last four years. 
Uh, you can see also that really you probably have to reform the banking sector as well. You have to try to you know increase the value value of the individual citizen with respect to paying taxes and you know creating economies that are based on more predictable tax revenues from individuals, which is hard because individuals move, right? You know, so in some cases it really is, you know, more interesting and more profitable to try to attract, you know, the IPO uh, rather than, you know, a community of, in of individuals that is closely knit. And then that's, that's what takes you to the idea of what are you trying to create? Are you trying to create a country that is mired in debt but has high economic growth? Or are you trying to create a country with a thousand different communities of people who trust each other more more often than not so often and how do you get there without trying to go backwards into a <clears throat> an Amish type of lifestyle you know in other words and I shouldn't say backwards I'm not being derogatory I'm speaking about economically um, you know if you have a purely localized system uh, you are in a sense not modern in the 21st century because so much of the economy is globalized and here we are. So <clears throat> the lessons to take from all this here, you know, at the end of the day, are that independent you know, systems don't necessarily matter. Labels matter even less. Uh, what really matters is going to be competence and integrity and how to increase those you know, aspects within your society, you know, while also attempting to compete on economic growth. And how do you get economic growth while maintaining a community? Uh, but hopefully one that's not, you know, tied, and hopefully one that, that's, that's got a sustainable debt management system that is based on individual tax revenue uh, as opposed to something that's more, that fluctuates more, such as capital gains. There you go.